Hi, this is Brian Keene. You know what I've been waiting for and looking for desperately is a vampire novel, something new, something that will give vampires their teeth back. Uh, and now that novel exists. It's a new novel from Chandler Morrison. It's called Until the Sun. And trust me, folks, when I tell you this is not your grandmother's vampire novel. It's a novel about responsibility, authority, and mortality. It asks if you could liberate yourself of these burdens, would any cost be too great? Chandler Morrison, Until the Sun. Uh, it's available right now in pre order on Kindle for just $1.99. Uh, the paperback and the Kindle edition both come out on the holiest of days, Halloween, from our friends at Death's Head Press. And as I said, you can pre order the Kindle edition right now. For just a dollar ninety nine, that is until the sun by Chandler Morrison. This week's show is also brought to you by our good friends at AdamandEve.com. They've got stuff for couples and solos, movies, massage oils, lingerie, vibrators, bondage gear, and so much more. Uh, select almost any one item for fifty percent off, and then Adam and Eve will give you free stuff. Why will they give you free stuff? Because at checkout. You're going to enter the offer code KEEN. That's K double E N E. Only at adamandeve.com. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Motherfucker! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment! The f. Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free on Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, because it's no longer called iTunes. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene, with me, uh, sitting to my right, my new right-hand man, Matt Wilson. Hello, everyone. It is. I got to tell you, it's still weird to look over and see you sitting in that chair, man. <laughs> not weird in a bad way. No, I'm. I'm sure you're not used to this well, at yeah, all. Yet. I mean, it's... you know, for for five years, uh, no matter where we've been recording this show. Now, you know, we started out uh, at my kitchen table, in, right, in the apartment complex I lived in, and you know, then we moved. Here to the the new home along the river, and we were in what was the laundry room, and then finally we built this nice studio out here. Uh, yeah. But for those five years, Dave has always been there to my, my right. right. You know, right. the opening right. is always with me as always. Yep, Dave Thomas. Uh, yeah, I miss him too, though. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I like doing this, and I'm glad that you know. Um, because the the episode I had just done by myself, I had seen somebody post like, "How long is it going to be until Brian?" is like screaming for Dave to come back yeah, because Matt that. pushes the buttons. And, you know, Dave was, I, I feel glad knowing that he has confidence enough in me that I can do this and he's not worried about it. Yeah. Like, I mean, Dave said nice things about your, your performance last week. Good job on that, by the well, way. Thank you. I, I tried. I wanted to do more than just read some show notes and then just end it. Cause right. I don't know. No, uh, uh, Dave, Dave, really praised your performance and dave never has nice things to say about anything except you know <laughs> terrible television shows that's true um, yeah i mean he ranks right up there with christopher golden in that regard but he's <laughs> listening right now in chemo golden. and his blood pressure is going up <laughs> doctors are like what the hell's going on in there so but yeah it, it's it's weird having you there but it's it's good because i too am confident 
in your competence. Well, thank you. Know. I really appreciate um, it. And uh, of course, it's strange. Mary is not here with us this week. Yeah. Um, she's up in New Jersey uh, with her family. And of course, Phoebe's not here. Dungeon Master isn't here. It's Coop quiet. and Lombardo aren't here. <laughs> Uh, it's very quiet. I hope this isn't a foreshadowing of things to come for the show. No, nah, you know? I don't think so. I mean, you know, Coop and Lombardo, they, they are on on occasion. Yeah. Uh, Phoebe and Dungeon Master are on a little bit more frequently. I actually, I love it when your son comes on. Oh, yeah. Because I just the chemistry the two of you have together and like... Especially that last time when Jensen was here. Yeah. And he kept wanting to try and give him whiskey. And he's just like halfway across the table, like looking back at you like, can a dad? What? Please? And the thing is, he's only 11, but he he totally grasps, okay, this is a bit for the air. He's a he, really intelligent kid. Yeah. Like, you know, he, he cautioned his mother. Now, mom, you may hear some things on this week's episode, but it's just for the it's air. It's just for fun. I wasn't really going to do it. Like, he knows innately... Okay, I can get away with this. I can't get away with this. Right. You know? Yeah, he's um, he's a really smart kid. He yeah. and I are, are working on a plan for this New Year's. Of course, uh, last New Year's, we did that episode where, you know, for five years, I'd interviewed everybody else. And he said, oh, right, Dad, yeah. wouldn't it be cool if I interviewed you? And I said, well, let's do that for our New and Year's And he's episode. right. It, it was really cool. Yeah. When, it, when It was a good interview. So we, uh, we, we've got something different coming up. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, he's a good little interviewer. You, you go back to... Uh, Reeve Blasey, you know, the actor from I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday. Now, uh-huh. he and Reeve are the same age, you know. Um, and if you go back, I can't remember what episode number it is, but uh, if you, if you go back and listen to it, mm-hmm. it, it it's, I want to say it's cute, but that, that's almost taking away <laughs> from it. Like, it's a genuine, you know, right. 10-year-old interviewing another 10-year-old. Yeah. And like their thoughts on the genre and creativity and That's awesome. You know, and their dads and you know, it's <laughs> right. it's cool. Um so yeah, it it's weird just you and me here, but but we will get through it. Uh coming oh, yeah. up later in the show, <laughs> uh novelist, screenwriter, and journalist Andrew J. Roush. Uh he's going to join myself and John Urbansick. Obviously, it's a it's a pre recorded interview, uh, but he's going to talk about his new book, "My Best Friend's Birthday: The Making of a Quentin Tarantino Film," uh, which is out right now. It's out this week. That's why we're saving oh, the interview okay. for now. Awesome. Uh, he's going to talk about a lot more. He's had one hell of a career, uh, I mean, as most of the people that you interview do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can do it in this business, he's done it. Uh, fascinating guy to talk to. Are you a Tarantino fan? Yeah. All right. Well, then, yeah. You you definitely when you're mixing the show, yeah, you'll I'm definitely, pro- I'm definitely gonna to listen to it. Yeah. Um. He he's got some some great stories about him and stuff. I like the uh, I like the Asher Ellis interview too. That was a really fun interview. Yeah, that was a good yeah. one too. You know, I, I I may I may be onto something here with this this interview thing. Yeah. I think if this so. <laughs> if this writing gig doesn't work out for me, uh, speaking of writing, I want to remind folks this Saturday, October twenty sixth, uh, I will be signing at Second and Charles in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Mary will be there, uh, nice. as well as authors Robert Swartwood, Stephen Kozanowski, Kelly Owen, Robert Ford, and Wesley Southern. I think that's everybody. I may be I forgetting someone. I think that's what I saw in the tweets and okay, stuff. Yeah. yeah. I know originally they wanted we wanted to do like 24 authors, and the store explained that, no, you're insane. We just don't have the room for that. I mean, like, it's a decently sized store, but they just have it packed to the gills already like yeah yeah um so yeah man good job last week i'm glad to be back on the air i'm glad that i can hear you talk if i sound (laughs) do i sound funny no no you don't this is the first day that i've i've talked for any length of time yeah um i i guess some listeners may not get my weekly newsletter they they may not know what was if, if you don't get my weekly newsletter you should unfuck that yeah, you should go to really briankeen.com and subscribe it's right there at the top of the page uh but yeah i uh <laughs> about 6 months ago i got punched not surprised yeah you know <laughs> uh, as christopher as christopher golden said uh you know we don't ask why Brian got punched. <laughs> he runs his mouth asking people to punch him every day. That's his forte. Uh, but, yeah, I, I got punched, and uh, then I punched the guy back. Okay. And uh, he got the worst of it. I was going to say, how, who got it the worst? No, he, yeah. got, he got the worst. I Yours mean, just I, came later. <laughs> yeah, I thought I, I thought I walked away unscathed. Right. You know, there wasn't, I mean, a tiny little bit of blood or anything, but I was fine. Um, well, it turns out, six months later... 
I have a cracked tooth. Yeah. It's a wisdom tooth all the way in the See, back. When um when you were telling me about this, right? I got scared because I have a cracked wisdom tooth as well because yeah. I just refused to get them out I right. guess, when I was younger. And uh, I thought about that myself. I was like, oh, shit. I literally do have, like, a gaping open spot in my yeah. one wisdom tooth. And I'm like, oh, oh well. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is yeah, now. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, uh, we're, you know, Mary and uh, Kelly Owen and Robert Ford and I, we rode up to the Merrimack Halloween yeah. book festival together. And that Saturday morning, I woke up and I, th- I thought I had an ear infection because mm-hmm. my ear was on this side was all clogged and. You know how your jaw hurts sometimes? Yeah. Um, so I went over to this little grocery store, and I got, what did I get? I got a leaf, and I got some some minced garlic and uh, some oregano leaves. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, I was I was a treat <laughs> to be with at dinner, thing. boy. Oh, man. I had dinner with, Mary and I ate with uh, Paul Tremblay and John Langan and uh, uh, Grady Hendrix. And and some friends of theirs joined us. Uh, just a delightful evening. But I I made sure that when I talked, I would like you lean kept back from the back, table, yeah. or I'd look towards Mary because you know she can smell it. But I I didn't want Grady Hendrix or you know Paul Tremblay or John Langan going on social media. Jesus Christ, Brian Keene smells <laughs> like a you know anti vampire antidote. But uh, speaking speaking of yes, before before I get back to the story, I am so pissed off at myself. Why is that? Okay, at Merrimack, I recorded uh, two panels. I I recorded one that I did. And then uh, uh, Grady Hendrix, um, and who the fuck was on it with him? I can't even remember. (laughs) 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 And it's the painkillers. Right, yeah. uh, Oh, it was Craig Shaw Gardner. Okay. Grady and Craig did this great, just uh, Q and A about really terrible movies and weird movies that you should watch. Oh man, okay. I would have loved to have been. Uh, <laughs> I, I, oh yeah, it was it was one of the best things I've ever heard. And I'm like, hey, uh, you guys care if I record this for the show? And they're like, no, go ahead. So I put the portable recorder down. I hit record. I verified it was running. Okay. Yeah. I changed the fucking batteries before I started. Batteries died. When I came back after they were done, the fucking recorder is completely dead. So what I don't fuck? know, and you know how good I am with that portable recorder. I don't know how to play it back and see if I got the interview or not. Right. So I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> so if you can look at that, cool. If not, we'll wait until Dave I'll, is on I'll demand. And and we'll, we'll have, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so anyway, you know, the, the garlic and shit, it helped. Um, but then Sunday morning we woke up and it was bad again. And I took some more and it seemed to help. Um we got home, but yeah, by Monday morning, I was bad. And by Monday night, it was like hurting to talk. Yeah. Well, when, um, when you told me that, you know, I'm, I'm, you, what, I, I'm trying to remember how you phrased it. You're just like, I'm done. I'm out or something. And you're like, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really fucking sick. I'm out. Like, you're going to, you might have to record one this week. And I was like, fucking conventions, yep. man. That's what I thought it was at first. Well, was that you got, that's what I from, thought too. Yeah. I thought, okay, I picked up an ear infection up here. Um, so I go to the doctor, uh, I go to urgent care, you know, cause no health insurance. The yeah. first doctor says, oh yeah, it's a, it's a sinus infection. Remember, it's a, it's a, it's a virus. Take some Flonase. It's a Flonase. <laughs> so I paid $149 for this motherfucker to tell me take Flonase, which is not cheap either. No, it isn't. Okay. So I go and I buy the fucking Flonase and I squirt it up there and nothing happens. And by Monday night, I can tell, holy shit, my jaw and my neck are infected. You know how I could tell? My lymph node was as big as your head, Matt. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it, over the course of the day, it just started swelling and pulsing. So I go back Monday night, and I get a different doctor. They charge me $50 for a follow-up visit. Oh my God. And that doctor agrees that the first doctor was an idiot, and she puts me on antibiotics. Um, but because I had waited so long, it it took them... Up until I guess basically Saturday morning to actually kick in and knock this shit out. But yeah, it turns Jesus. out what it was, it's some kind of little bacterial infection. And it just got, spread got into that crack tooth. So my advice to you is uh, you know, because I, I get it, man. I, I'm living without insurance too. If the tooth ain't bothering you, don't pull it out if you if you don't, you know, if you don't have the means. But 
as soon as you start to feel a twinge back there, <laughs> get yourself some <laughs> antibiotics, antibiotics and, yeah. and knock that shit out. But yeah, it was it was to the point where I could not talk at all. That's why I had you record, uh, Mary. Yeah. I was texting her things from the cow. Well, first I was trying to get her to read my lips, and she couldn't. Right. So I had to text her everything. But yeah, it was up until Saturday morning. I was I was in bad shape. Now I feel really bad that you called me that one day. Well, I sounded like death when I talked. Boy, it sounded like you were gargling rocks. Well, like it was. <laughs> and what's what sucks is Dungeon Master. He didn't. He did not comprehend. Dad can't talk. Oh, uh, Dad's fine. Dad's not running a fever. You know, Dad's up and moving, but Dad can't fucking can't talk. talk. So, like, I'd take him to school in the morning, and he'd be in the backseat. Yap, bap, 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 bap. <laughs> and he'd You're pause, like, uh-huh. and I'd grunt. <laughs> yeah. And he'd be like, everything okay, Dad? You know. Uh, um, You're like Tim Allen in the face. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, but I'm glad I can talk, because we need to talk, my friend. Yes, we do. About California's proposed AB5 oh, legislation. Have you read about this? I've read some of this, yes. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's loony. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's okay now, folks. You know we don't get political on the show. Uh, we have a big staff. We have let's see, you, me, Mary, Dave, Phoebe, Dungeon Master, Coop, Lombardo. We have eight people on staff. Yeah. Plus, let's count Armand, the owner of the Project Entertainment yeah. Network, and our politics veer from wildly liberal. To staunchly conservative, yes. Uh, you know, m- me myself, I'm a, I'm an independent, but you know, we're all over the place on this show, and we all get along, and that's what should happen. Yeah. You know, none of us are racist, misogynistic douchebags. No, um, we just, you know, we have, we we fall differently on the spectrum. But regardless of your politics, this is an example, an egregious example, a of government overreach, and yep. and b of. A politician who's trying to do the good thing, but, but has no idea what, has no yeah. idea what they're doing. No. Um, AB5 is a bill in California. It was signed into law back on September 18th. Uh, it goes into effect January 1st. Okay. It was designed uh, to crack down on companies who misclassify would-be employees as independent contractors. For example, the big example is is Uber and Lyft. Um, you know, they have these folks that drive for them every day, just like a taxi cab company. Yeah. But they classify them as independent contractors, so they don't have to give them health insurance. They don't have to give them 401k, etc. Okay? Yeah, which, because of an, another law passed in previous years, that's why most people do that. Right. It's it's gig economy. Because it will kill companies. Yeah, it's a gig economy. Yeah. Um, and... So, you know, the the bill itself at heart wants to do good. I, I, I don't think this woman set out to be no, malicious. I do see the good intention behind it. Yeah. But in the black and white of the law itself. Right. You're you're killing people. Right. Because, like, because yeah. the, the problem is freelance writers have been lumped in uh, with these independent contractors. And I, I want to clarify something. A lot of the, the mainstream press. They're spinning this as just freelance journalists, just journalists writing for news sites, okay? Yeah. No. This impacts all freelance writers, which is why we're talking about it. I was going to say, show. that's what I got out of it. Yeah. Like, even if you just say write for Game Informer. Yeah. You're, you're a fle- freelance writer. Even if like, you're writing for Ginger Nuts of Horror or Room Org yeah. or Bloody Disgusting, this impacts Andrew J. Roush, who we've got coming up on the show. This would impact him. Mm-hmm. This would impact Mary and I. We both write articles for Centennial Media. Uh, right. You know, they do the the slick, glossy magazines you see at, like, the grocery store and yeah. Walmart. Um, in fact, uh, I, I know that he will not want his name on the air because he does it under a pseudonym. But uh, there is a very popular screenwriter and novelist uh, I know who I'm always surprised when I hear he's doing gigs like this because uh-huh. I would think he doesn't need to do that. Right. It's like... <laughs> um, but yeah, he he's also writing for those slick magazines. He lives in California, so this would absolutely impact him. Oh, he's at ground zero yeah. for this. Yeah. Um, in fact, he's the one that turned me on to this. Okay. Uh, but yeah, basically, this this bill impacts them. Um, what it says: if you are a freelance writer and you write for a magazine, newspaper, 
webzine, website, etc., uh, whose central mission is to disseminate the news. The law says you are capped at writing 35 submissions per year per employer. And to, to, to round that out, if you do the math and say that you're a free, freelance writer and you only work for one employer, that's, if you round it up, three articles a month. Right. Which is nowhere near enough for no, you to support yourself. No. Most people will hit that cap in a month. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, you're, you're, you know, what you're making per article, it varies wildly. Um, you know, some people are getting as, as little as $25 per article. And some are getting a buck a you word. Know, yeah, some are, yeah. Some are getting five bucks a word. Uh, you yeah. know, I do a, I, I, I don't think. I'm not allowed to say this on the air. You know, I'm. I mean, I'm, if you're not sure, maybe. <laughs> I'm getting, uh, you know, I'm getting 600 bucks for a thousand, 1200 word okay. article. Uh, you know, um, but I'm only doing maybe at the most six of those per year because it, it's basically backup income for me. It's, right. oh shit, I can't make the car payment this month. Uh, book sales were low. Hey, you guys need an article on beekeeping for your prepper magazine? <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's, that's what, but I'd love to read a Brian King beekeeping. Article. Oh, it's coming. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. The, awesome. the next issue of, uh, I had no idea you uh, were versed in beekeeping. Uh, the next <laughs> issue of, uh, one of their prepper magazines. I can't remember which one because I, I write for a couple. Yeah, it, it's about beekeeping in okay. the apocalypse. So. I had no idea you knew about beekeeping. <laughs> oh, dude, I've got 32 hives. Where? Not here on the property. Oh, okay. In orchards and on my dad's farm. And, oh, okay. Yeah, my dad was a beekeeper. Um, he got me into it cool. at an early age. Um, my dad tried to get me into football and deer hunting and beekeeping. Beekeeping was what stuck. Okay. I played football once. Right. I got tackled by, like, everyone. You're like, no, fuck uh, this. I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> this is the first time I ever got in a fight with my old man. Because uh, I little fourth grade Brian walked off that field and said, fuck this. <laughs> and I didn't get in trouble for using the F word. I got in trouble for walking off the field. You get back out there. Fuck you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, yeah, me and Neil Gaiman and Patrick Freevold, we are the genre's beekeepers. Oh, but, that's uh, pretty cool. But yeah, so this this article, uh, it was it was done by California Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, and mm -hmm. and Miss Gonzalez, I mean no disrespect, but what the fuck? What the yeah, fuck? Like are I previously you doing? said, I can see the good that was intended behind this idea, right? But at the same time, you're you're cutting them off, right? And so it, you're just making it even worse. And, like, where did they come up with the arbitrary number of 35 articles? Well, and see, that's what pisses me off. I, I want to give Miss Gonzalez the benefit of the doubt. Because, like yeah. I said, at its heart, th this bill seeks to do good, okay? But if you go on Twitter and read her responses to the, the, the writers who are reaching out to her in right. her publicly available form, she just... I don't know if it's her writing them or if she has somebody writing them, but so many of them just come off as so snide and so sarcastic yeah, a few and of them so do. dismissive. Um, you know, uh, she even says, you, you know, you said about the the arbitrary thing. Um, let me find her quote here. Because uh, like 35 just seems like a number somebody picked yeah, out of Yeah, she says head. here, she says... Uh, she and her team decided that a weekly columnist sounded like a part-time worker. So they halved that worker's yearly submissions. Uh, now, after all this uproar, the number was bumped up to 35. So originally it was 25. Jesus Christ. Now she says 35. And she says in a, in a quote to the, to the press, she says, quote, was it a little arbitrary? Yeah. Writing bills with numbers like that are a little bit arbitrary. End quote. No! That's not how government works. You get your facts Holy in order. If hell. you don't know, you go and find experts. You interview people. You you don't need to have hearings and summon them, you know, but you, you go out and you talk to people. You don't just create arbitrary fucking numbers. Especially when none of you are versed in that f like field of work. Right. You're like, a it, chef, right? Yeah. I, if, if, and I may run for 
congressperson okay. in Pennsylvania at some point. I, every year I threaten to do it. Every year Mary talks me out of it. But her arguments are getting weaker and weaker. <laughs> um, I may run. And I may do some kind of bill legislation that, I don't know, protects uh, undocumented workers working in the kitchen. Okay. okay? Um, and in that, I may decide that, you know, uh, you can only make – four meals per per evening mm. how many customers you get on an evening uh good evening like you know like if we're talking like a saturday and yeah. we're hopping we maybe like flip 300 covers 300 okay well then i'll bump it to you can make 25 meals per evening now i know that's a little arbitrary matt but when <laughs> you know when you're doing a bill like this it is a little arbitrary i have to rotate out people <laughs> <laughs> All right, your 25's up, next in, tag in. I mean, that's that in a nutshell is what Lorena Gonzalez has done here. Yeah. Um she I I get I get what she's going for, but clearly, madam, you have not talked to any writers. No. Um so yeah, this this will absolutely kill freelance writers who live in California. It already is starting to take effect. I will not name names, but I've talked to one, two, three, four different publishers uh, who are already looking at where their freelancers live and planning, you know, because they're already taking submissions for next year's stuff. Right, right. And they're already weighing, hey, does this person live in California? I'm going to have to, you know, well, yeah, and then people this... are already losing work and this bill doesn't even go in effect until right. January Right, and once 1st. this starts... I have a feeling this kind of thing is going to be like uh, I'll use like a term like the the outbreak map where you just see it spread from one end no, to the other. You're right because now New York is looking at doing the same thing. Of course thing, they are. You know. <laughs> um so yeah, I you know. And then a line of work that's so hard to get a gig to begin with. Right. I, I just you're going to kill everything. It I don't understand it. It's like publication should fall under a I feel like it should fall under a like wheelhouse where it's just like it is what it is and it's free speech and it's you know like we shouldn't be able to throw a law like this that limits the amount of actual news and or articles that can reach people. Right. Like I, I don't understand any of this at all. It's I don't either. I don't. It's, either. it's like you said. It's it's government reaching its finger. It, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. Right. As another and you know it it doesn't make any sense and you're taking freedoms away from people right I, so yeah i i don't know that that know. lorena gonzalez listens to the horror show with brian keen i mean I, I we do have politicians on both sides of the aisle right that do in fact listen um and i would just like to send a little special shout out to uh barack out there listening um you know the offer's still open you can come on the show um, that would be amazing does that does that ever blow you away I mean that one Barack Obama may be listening to you in the heart. I you know, I can't say that he's listening to every episode. Uh, I try not to but, think about certain things. But I know that at least <laughs> one of his people very high up in the organization listens weekly. Awesome. You know. I'll have to remember too. And and he does follow me on Twitter. Oh, okay. So, you know. <laughs> Donald Trump will not follow me on Twitter. I'm not sure why. I'm I'm totally shocked by that. Maybe it's cuz I called him an orange hobgoblin. It, it I'm, might I'm have not something sure, to do with but, it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. After that time, you told me that I made a joke about the Langoliers and like, yeah, you know, you know King you actually heard yeah, what I said. I was like, I'm not going to talk. You can't make Stephen King jokes on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I love you. <laughs> I used to make Dean Koontz jokes all the time, but now, you know, love you, Dean. <laughs> you never know who's listening. Anyway. And, and the I, comments that I've made about this, I mean, no disrespect yeah. to anybody who made like they put this law in motion, uh, especially the uh, woman in charge. I don't mean any res disrespects, but and I, I get the optics. We're two middle aged white guys, right? Uh, but you know, this isn't about gender or about politics or about race or anything else. This is this is about writers, uh, ma'am. Yeah. I've been doing this twenty one years, okay. And if I lived in California right now, you you would be effectively ending my career. Right. And even even so, if it's not even writers, it's just the idea of letting somebody make an honest living to support themselves or their family. Right. You're taking that away from them. Right. That's so. that's the most minute point that it boils down to. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I don't know. All right. Well, let's hear from a freelance writer who this this law absolutely would impact and Andrew J. Roush. But before we do that, I want to remind folks that uh, Adam and Eve, our good friends yes. at adamandeve.com, brought you this philosophical political discussion <laughs> uh, because Adam and Eve, they're not just about sex toys. They're about all things. They're about the horror show with Brian Keene. There's so <laughs> much about the horror show with Brian Keene that they have an offer code. It's my last name, K-E-E-N-E. -E. Uh, if you enter that at checkout at adamandeve.com, you will get 10 tantalizing free gifts. Uh, and I should say that everything you order from them is shipped discreetly. It's free shipping mm -hmm. and it's discreet shipping. So yeah, <laughs> K-E-E-N-E -E at checkout at adamandeve.com. This week's show is also brought to you by Chandler Morrison's brand new vampire novel, Until the Sun. Chandler Morrison, of course, one of the most controversial figures in the genre this year. Uh, you know, his, his performance at Bizarro Con, certainly we had a few shows about that, but you know what, Matt? Next week... We're going to have Chandler himself Ooh. here on the show. He's going to talk about that. He's going to set the record straight. Nice. He's going to talk about this new novel. He's going to talk about everything in between. It's a really good interview. Cool. Um, we will have that next week. But right now, let's go to Andrew J. Roush, All and right. we will catch you on the flip side. Oh, hey, I didn't hear you come in. Matt here. Welcome to my spooky editing studio. I'd just like to take the time to let you all know that the last couple minutes of this interview were lost due to technical difficulties, and the horror show would like to apologize to its listeners and to, of course, Mr. Andrew Rausch. Without further ado, let's get on with the interview. Okay, joining me today is American film journalist, author, screenwriter, film producer, actor, basically jack of all trades. Uh, his over 20 published books include The Suicide Game, Riding Shotgun, Turning Points in Film History, and the forthcoming My Best Friend's Birthday, The Making of a Quentin Tarantino Film. In 2012, he assisted horror filmmaker Herschel Gordon Lewis, who you all have heard about on this show, uh, with his memoir, The Godfather of Gore Speaks, which we also talked about on the show. His screenwriting credits include Dahmer vs. Gacy. Uh, production credits include Dead in Love, Zombiegeddon, and Evil Ever After. Uh, his book, The Stephen King Movie Quiz Book, co-written with Ronald Riley, was published by Bear Manor Media. Uh, I Am Hip Hop. The list goes on and on and on. I am, of course, talking about... Andrew J. Roush, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank so I have to say that list is really out of date. Um, it is. But um, I, it sounded like the Wikipedia page, but which is cool, but um, I have done a lot more since then. Oh, absolutely. I, you're up to, when I was doing my research, you're up to almost 40 books, right? Almost 40 books yeah. now, yeah. Yeah. But um, I should mention to the audience, we're recording this at KillerCon, so you, you may hear a little bit of noise in the background. If so, it's cool. Uh, what's funny, Andy, you walked in, you had no idea the convention was going No, I didn't we even was, know. We were meeting up to I know, to and there's, and, all, there are people, you know, that I know by reputation, or you know. people that, um, like, you know, Ralph James White was in an anthology that I, uh, co-edited with Chris Roy, but you know, but, um, and Joe Lansdale, whom you and I just yep, saw Joe. a little while ago, and was it, in that. It occurred to me, Bev Vincent, who also right. does a lot of Stephen King stuff. Right. Um, and, and that, 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 that made me think, that Stephen King movie quiz book, uh -huh. you know, it's a throwaway book, but you, you put a lot of effort into it. Right, right. But I bet, is it still in print? Is that, it that's is. like a perennial seller? Isn't yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Um, it doesn't sell as much. It, a lot of it's because it's a smaller publisher and, um, I mean, it doesn't sell what I'd like it to sell, but, right. but it sells okay. But you know, like, uh, Bev and them had another one that came out like right after that that was basically the same thing, but theirs has really nice artwork. Right. So, um, you know, theirs was with Cemetery Dance. <laughs> And a funny story, and I don't think it was on purpose, but I had originally pitched my book to Cemetery Dance years before and never heard anything back. And, and so years passed by and, and, uh, we finally do our book and lo and behold, they come up with one too. And, you know, and I think it's, uh, not on purpose. I think it's just one of those things, but because I know all those guys at Cemetery didn't write for them some. Right. But, uh, I'm sorry. While you're talking, Andy, John Urbansick is interrupting to hand me a phone charger. 
You want to sit in a co-host job? Sure. Since we don't have Mary or Dave. <laughs> so should, should I be Mary or Dave? Do I need to make smart checks? Smart. You need to be or? smart because I'm too tired at this point <laughs> to ask smart questions. So, all right, here we go. My phone's charging. So let's start at the beginning because you you really do do everything. I mean, and as you said, there's stuff in your bio I didn't even cover. I'm what? doing comics now. Yeah. That's big. Like, um, just a lot of stuff. Well, I, master, I say jack of all trades, master of none. That's the, <laughs> but that's not true. I hope not. It's not. I hope not. What was your first love? Like, what was the first? Was it film? Was it comics? Was it was it, film. Well, yeah. when I was a kid, I loved comics. And, you know, I loved movies. And I loved The Twilight Zone. Loved Twilight Zone. And I found Stephen King when I was in, you know, uh, middle school. So I knew I wanted to be a writer, but... um Really, the thing I always go back to, and this ties in with my new book, it was when I saw Pulp Fiction in September of uh, 1994, when it, the night it was released. How old? That were you? I, uh, 1994. That was uh, 20. I don't know, early 20s. Okay. I don't want to do the math. I'm tired, right. but I uh, a long time ago. A lot. Uh, I wish I was closer to that age now. I guess. But, right. But that really opened my eyes, and I realized I wanted to write about film, and and so for a long time that was what I did, and that was sort of my in. But in the meanwhile, I was working on fiction and just, you know, trying to learn that and right. master that. And not that I've mastered it, but, you know, working on it. And, right. But that was the film that, that did it all for me. Hope Fiction, I mean, you know, you and I were talking off the air. Tarantino is a master of right. dialogue, as are Elmore Leonard, Joe Lansdale. I mean, you, you, same right, same right. stuff I'm into. Right. Um, in comics, when you're a kid reading them, were there writers that had that same sort of cadence that you, you knew without checking the credit box? Oh, you know, Steve Gerber's writing this or Bill Mantlo's writing I'd this. love to tell you yes, but I, I didn't get that deep into them. Like, I read... You know what's funny? I wasn't reading superhero comics like everybody else. I would occasionally pick them right. up. But until later... Um, like, I got sick one time and I was in the hospital and uh, they had these free comics and they were all Spider-Man comics. And they were like, well, you can take as many as you want. Well, I took a stack, and that's when I got into superhero. <laughs> but before that, um, I was very much into war comics, like G.I. Really? G. Combat. You okay. know, they had those um, Joe Kubert covers. Oh, and, yeah. You know, Sergeant um, Rock, Weird Right, Weird all Rock. of that stuff. The Unknown Soldier, Sergeant Rock, Sergeant Fury. Um, so I was really into a lot of that stuff for whatever yeah. reason. And, uh, you know, and so I guess the, I ended up joining the military later on, probably because of all that stuff. But were you into I was in the reserves. Reserves? It was Army? in the reserves. Army reserves, yeah. yeah. I was, I we was, hadn't... Oh, you were in the military? I was Navy, so we, we cool. got along. It was, right, I was right. more in the Marines because right. we were going to have to flip the table. Here. I know, we have to get into it. <laughs> but, so um, all that time, you know, when you're a kid, when you're in the hospital, when you're a young man in the military, are you, are you writing at that point or is it still in the back of your head that, hey, maybe that's something I want to do? Well, the funny thing is I tried to write my first novel when I was about 12 and... Sort of like, you know, Lansdale was telling us, well, you know, I tried, I didn't get as far as he did. And it's funny, I wanted a manual typewriter. I don't know why I had this notion. You know, my parents said, you don't want an electric typewriter. And I said, no, I want a manual one. Well, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but, but you know, I got one and, and, and I didn't know how to type. So it was hunting and packing at 12. And that weirdly enough, the first thing that I tried to write was a crime novel. And it was about the mob. Now, a 12-year-old in Kansas does not know anything about the mob. <laughs> but but weirdly enough, that's what a lot of my fiction is about now. And I think that's why things like Pulp Fiction and Goodfellas and those things really resonated with me. Right. And have stuck with me. And and those are... And Elmore Leonard. And, you know, all of those things are huge influences in that way for me. Yeah. Well, I also learned to type on a manual typewriter. Did you? I mean, finding right. Typing up lyrics to Beatles songs. Oh, there you go. Off of records. Yeah, so, right. So, <laughs> so your writing started out better than mine if you were writing Beatles, by, uh, Beatles <laughs> lyrics, because uh, hard to top some of those. Did you, like, when you started doing fiction uh -huh. for, for professional? Right. Because you were doing nonfiction first. Did you have trouble making that transition, or? Well, I actually tried fiction before that, um, so I have to say, but, I mean, I was really bad at it, like most people are when they first start, and I was... Uh, like a lot of people, you know, I, I, I had told you that I had a hard time. Most of my longer works are not horror. But what's funny is back then, I was like a lot of people, I was trying to imitate Stephen King. Right. I was doing these really bad Stephen King imitations. And so my early work was horror, um, and none of that got published. And like a lot of writers, I had a year where I was uh, 18, 19, you know, where I probably had 100 rejections. Right. Because, you know, back then you had to send them out by mail and wait for them to come back and and you'd hope to at least get some comments and not that dreaded form letter, 
you know, um, so it was a it, it was a hard road. But uh, luckily, the nonfiction got me in there and got me. It, it bided my time. You know what right. I mean? Like. It, I, it allowed me to work while still learning what the hell I was doing. I know personally in reading your stuff, um, and there are other writers that do this, but and I, I suspect they probably have the same background. Your stuff reads very cinematically. It you know, there's not a lot of fluff. There's not a right. lot holding. It's bam, bam. It's punchy. That's that's probably the the film background. And you're it is the film, film background film. because when I write, I tend to see it as film. Which is funny because when I write screenplays, it's more difficult for me. Like you'd think that would be easier, and I don't know why that is. But when I write, um, when I write fiction, I see it as movie scenes. I really yeah. do. And um, so, you know, I think that's why when I found Elmore Leonard, that really resonated with me. And of course, we all know his rule of you know leave out the things that bore people. But you know, like a lot of um, you know, I don't. I try try not to use three or four pages to describe the room. Now, somebody like Stephen King can get away with that, right. and I would write, I would read anything he wrote. You know, um, he could do his laundry list, and I would read it. But or his uh, not his laundry list, but his um, his grocery list, his grocery list, and I, I would read, read his that. Grocery list, right? It's right. Fascinating, right? <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's it's. Uh, but I, I tend to like you know very lean. I try to go very lean, right. and I try to. A lot of people talk about when they do rewrites, they actually their stuff grows. Mine always shrinks. So, yeah. you know. Um, do, you, do you work on more than one thing at a time, or do you have to stay focused on one project? I usually work on one fiction thing at a time, but I'll have, like right now I have eight or nine books in the works. People think, you know, they say you're so prolific, but they don't know that a lot of those things take years. Right. You know, I mean, I had a year in the last year where I had something like eight books come out, which is ridiculous, but a lot of those I've been working on for a long time. There's a lot of research involved in those, right? There are. Uh, depending on what they are, there's a lot. I mean, some are easy. Like, I'm doing the one with Joe Lansdale now where it's um, a collection of interviews with him throughout his career, and that's for the University of Mississippi Press for their um, conversation series. Right. And stuff like that's pretty easy. It's more just a tracking down the right interviews and getting the rights to them. But there are things that are that are pretty difficult. Um, I tend to do a lot more now that's based on doing interviews because, yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of my thing is interviewing people, and I've gotten pretty good at it. And I feel like he's going to judge us, John. Hey, he's going to grade us. My, my, my interviewing skills are crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned you're working on the Lansdale thing, and that, that reminds me, that is something I wanted to bring up. Um, so when you're you're putting together a book of his interviews, right? I'm putting it, and I haven't announced this publicly yet, so this will be an exclusive. Oh, I'm Mary, right? <laughs> there you go. Um, I've been working on a, a book of his collecting everything he's ever written about writing. Oh wow! Uh, most of which that. he did on social media. So what I'd we love had to, to see do that. is we had to go from 2019 to 2011 when he joined Facebook. We had right. to go through every single oh. Facebook post, copy and paste it into a Word document, then scour Twitter, scour all the essays he'd written here and there, and now what I'm trying to do is make it cohesive. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I, I work with, hey, how about we put this here? Same process for you, or is it more just, here's the interviews I've collected? In that one, it's kind of just, here's the interviews i collected. I did do a book, Joe's in it, um, uh, I think Rath is in it, I can't remember who all, but... Um, you know, I just did a book, uh, or I'm finishing it up, where it's a uh, hundred authors discussing the craft. Right. And you know, the the main problem you find with that is there's a lot of redundancy. But if you're a, it's not gonna nobody else is gonna care except writers. Right. And even within the redundancies, there's enough differences that you can find things that you know one person's method does not work for you. It will not work for you. But you can maybe find things within that that affects your writing or that affects your process. Right. And so that was sort of the thing is you're not going to learn from everybody, but maybe you'll find pieces here and there that you can try. Maybe they'll work. Maybe they won't. Or maybe they'll inspire you to – maybe you'll realize my method is better than these. You just – you know, because I <laughs> – there were a few people in there that talked about, you know, very – kind of bragged about I only do one draft. And I I mean, I'm – that goes against everything I believe in, but – Right. Um, but how many, but how many drafts do you do? It varies, probably about three generally yeah. for fiction. Yeah, the people that do one draft tend to edit as they go. So well, see, I do that too. Draft, but it's right, not really I get that. Like draft. Vonnegut or the, or Elmore Leonard would write one like page that. a day, and I think Vonnegut did that, or or maybe Leonard would write a couple pages a day, but they would write the same amount, and they would just edit the shit out of that every day. And yeah. 
I so I do that, that, but I still will end up going back through and streamlining and yeah. cleaning up. And okay, so there you have it. So uh, big Tarantino fan that you are, I guess you uh, you're going to be pre-ordering my best friend's birthday, the making of a Quentin Tarantino film, right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, do want to remind folks uh, that this week's episode is brought to you by Chandler Morrison's Until the Sun. It's a new vampire novel out from Death's Head Press. The paperback. And the ebook drop on Halloween next week. But you can pre order the Kindle edition right now on Amazon for just a dollar ninety nine. What what else can you wow. get for a dollar ninety nine, Matt? Not much. Not much. But <laughs> you can you can get a brand new vampire novel. Buck ninety nine. Yeah. Um and you know, with the money you saved on that, you can go to adamandeve.com. Uh, of plenty. You know, buy some toys for 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 Mrs. Wilderson and uh, use K double E N E at checkout. <laughs> mm. Does Mrs. Wilson ever listen to the show? Uh, I don't think so. No, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> no, we'll that. find out. <laughs> She'll either come up to you and say, "Hey, so uh, what are you getting me for Christmas?" I don't think she knows where to find podcasts. No. I, I... <laughs> I don't mean I don't mean her any disrespect, but it's just does, does, I, she, does she know where to find toys and bondage gear and lingerie and massage oils? I, if she wanted it, I'm sure she would. Know. She she would know to go yeah. to adamandeve dot com. Yeah. Would she know to use K double E N E at checkout? I'll I'll leave her a note on leave the fridge. Her a note. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's doing it right. Um, so yeah, that is our show for this week, Matt. Anything else you want to talk about before yeah, we go? I think we're good, man. All right. Just a reminder, folks, if you enjoyed this nonsense, uh, you may enjoy Matt's solo podcast. It's called Grindcast. It's available on YouTube and elsewhere. Uh, you may also enjoy Defender's Dialogue. That's a show that Christopher Golden and I do every week where we talk about 1970s and 1980s Marvel comics. Uh, Matt's new book, Horrors Untold, on sale right now. Thor, Metal Gods, written by yep. me and and some other talented folks, up for pre-order right now. Of course, uh, before we go, we do want to remind you about Dave's GoFundMe. If you're a first-time listener, you might be wondering who this Dave person is. Well, Dave <laughs> is the person who usually sits in Matt's chair. Yep. Uh, he's undergoing a, a battle with cancer right now. Um, we have a fundraiser for him on GoFundMe. Just go to GoFundMe.com, type Dave Thomas in, and you'll see his uh, his thing pop up and if you can give them five bucks we'd really appreciate it yep and of course to advertise on the horror show with brian keen contact armand rosamilia at the project entertainment network to do that just go to project entertainment network.com click the contact button and uh, let him know hey those guys are pretty funny and uh i'd love to have a <laughs> not the stupidest podcasters i've ever heard <laughs> i think i would like to sponsor their show um Next week, as I said, Chandler Morrison. That's going to be awesome. So be exciting. ready for that. We'll see you then, folks. Bye. Bye. Bizarre. It's Bizarre, the Bizarre and Weird Fiction Podcast. Hosted by me, Mr. Frank. Bizarre is the showcase podcast of the Bizarro fiction genre. And those who write weird and read weird are going to love this podcast, where each week we talk to everyone who is anyone in the bizarre and weird fiction realm. So join us here every Monday, presented exclusively by Project Entertainment Network.